Hey, good morning, everybody. It is uh, good to see you. Do you know what today is? It's No Grape Sunday. Jenny just reminded you. That is what it is. And I felt I needed to remind you because some people told me last week that that was broken before they actually got to the parking lot. And so we want to keep encouraging it to be No Grape Sunday. Andy Walls reached out to me after the service, and he said, I like No Gratitude Sunday, but I think we ought to add it should be Encouragement Sunday. And I thought that's a really good point, but Andy, I lost sight of you. I've expanded that a little bit. I would like for it to be Praise, Gratitude, and Encouragement Sunday. And, and that acronym hit me when I opened up my PG&E bill this week, <laughs> because I immediately started griping. And the way the gripe sounded in my mind is how in the world did I let Nick Barons and the search team convince me to leave Illinois where the gas prices were cheaper and they didn't add on extra tax to the Dr. Pepper. And I started to gripe. And then I looked outside and I saw clear blue skies and the sun shining and 70 degree temperature. And I remembered this was my view from my office in February, just a couple of years ago. And I started to praise God and give thanks and think about who could I encourage to move to California, because this is a great place to be. And so let's be a people of praise. Jenny, I really appreciate what you've reminded us of today uh, to just uh, focus as we can on praising and giving thanks. If you're joining us for the very first time this morning, we want to welcome you. You've caught us at a really good time. We're starting into a brand new sermon series this morning. Now, be it a business, a team, a classroom, a well-thought-through action plan or game plan is a key to success. In fact, I would argue it is just as important, if not more important, than the vision of the organization. A vision tends to be far more inspiring than the nuts and bolts, how are we going to get it done plan. But if there is no plan, then vision usually amounts to little more than just this catchy saying that you find on marketing pieces and coffee mugs. And I'm afraid far too often this is as far as the vision has gone in most churches. But you have to start with vision. And so what is the vision of the church? Well, open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus, just prior to ascending to his rightful place in heaven, lays out his vision for 11 men who had spent the better part of three years by his side. And this is what Jesus said to them. Go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. What is Jesus' vision? Jesus says, here's my vision. My vision is that there will be people from all different nations around the world who will become citizens of the kingdom of God. And this vision is what those 11 men devoted their lives to. No longer was fishing or tax collecting or even being a good religious person the primary reason for their being. Day in and day out, they set out to persuade people to move from a place of ignorance, unbelief, even hostility into living in a relationship with and under the rule of King Jesus. This is it. This is what they were all about. They were focused, singly focused on this vision of being disciples who made disciples who make disciples. And this vision that was given to those 11 men, which became the first church, is still the vision for the church today. Hasn't changed. Caring for creation. Championing moral values. Fighting for a more equitable society. Those are all really good things. But they must be secondary to persuading and helping people discover the joy of following Jesus. 
Now, if we do this well, if we make disciples and not just churchgoers, then all of those good things that I've just mentioned, they are going to be addressed. You say, how can you be so sure? I'm sure for this reason, because a true disciple of Jesus Christ, he or she knows that that person is in partnership with God to bring about the renewal of all things so that they reflect God's original creation intention. And so those things are going to happen. So if you've been wondering, where's Campbell headed? What, What are we all about? Why do we exist? This is it. This is it. We are focused on making disciples who make disciples. That's what we're all about. Now, is this a vision that we can achieve? You better believe it is. There are people all around us, all around us, who are desperate to know and or experience a more authentic relationship with God. Even if they're not fully yet tuned into their heart's desire for a connection with the divine. It's this reality that Jesus tried to open the eyes of his disciples to in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35 through 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest fields. This is every bit as true today as it was then. Because God has never backed off for a single moment in pursuing the hearts of people. And because nothing else truly satisfies a soul other than God. Not power, not money, not success, not a relationship. There is still this hunger within an individual for a connection with the divine. In the famous words of Blaise Pascal, There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator, who made known through Jesus Christ. The harvest is plentiful. Now, let me say just a little bit about those who make up this harvest. Those who are included in the harvest are those who have yet to devote their lives to Jesus Christ. There are also those who at one time made a commitment to Jesus Christ, but now they've kind of turned away from Christ. And the harvest also includes every single person who has yet to be fully formed in Christ. In other words, every single person on the faith continuum is ripe for discipleship. And that includes each one of us. It's vitally important that we are being discipled as we strive to make disciples. Because none of us perfectly image Jesus yet. We're all a work in progress. So let me ask you, who is discipling you? Who is discipling you? the answer is no one, I want to encourage you to be thinking about that. Who can play that role in your life? And I want to assure you this morning that I'm not trying to ask something of you that I don't expect of myself. And so if you'd be curious about that, okay, Sean, who's discipling you then? I'd be be happy to have that conversation with you uh, privately and share with you some of the people that play that role in my life and what's happening in my life. I so wish, so wish, that I would have taken this much more seriously at a much younger age. It would have made a huge difference in my life. And it will as as yours. Now, the good news is, no matter where you are or how old you are, it's not too late. It's not too late to find people who may be just a little bit ahead of you on this journey of faith that would be more than happy, in fact, thrilled to spend time with you, helping you get to the place that you want to be. 
And so make sure that you find somebody that you partnership with in this discipleship process. Now, will we engage in this call to discipleship? I think that comes down to whether or not we share the heart of Jesus. When Jesus saw people who were just suffering under the tragedies of a broken world, and then on top of that, they were being mistreated by those who should have been pointing them to God, that was gut-wrenching for Jesus. Is it for us? When we look around at the people in our world and we see people who are suffering living in a broken world, does it break our heart? Does it break our heart when we see people who are battling illness and struggling with addiction, having hard times in their relationship and they're, they're afraid of death? Does it, does it put a knot in our stomach when we hear people tell these stories about how they feel let down by God or the church? Does it bring a tear to your eyes when you hear people talk about their spirituality, but they don't know Jesus? Does it cause you to toss and turn at night or stay awake at night when it dawns on you that there are people who are going to spend an eternity separated from God because they have never committed their lives to Jesus Christ? When our heart begins to beat as one with Jesus Christ, I think that's the point we're going to see this sense of urgency and being an answer to Jesus' prayer. That's the moment we'll say, you know what, Jesus, I'm going to stop praying for harvest workers. I'm going to be a harvest worker. I'm, I'm going to go make disciples because I share the heart that you share, and I want all people to come into this relationship with Jesus Christ that is so life-giving. And so that's the vision, but what is the plan? Is there one? Or is go make disciples just a tagline that we're going to put on coffee mugs and websites? Well, this week we're starting a brand new sermon series entitled The Game Plan. This series is intended to give us a glimpse of how to make disciples. A glimpse of how Jesus made disciples, formed his first group of disciples. The how-tos that we see the early Christians make as they went far and wide, striving to make disciples as well. And over the next five weeks, we're going to share with you some of the things that we're doing as a congregation to pr try to put these practical discipling making steps into practice right here at Campbell. But please recognize we're, we're just kind of scratching the surface as we share this with you. We need your creative thoughts and ideas, how we can be more effective in each of the areas that we're going to be highlighting. But one thing we realize is that we can't settle for status quo and expect to see a resurgence of interest in Jesus and following his ways. This time has come in our society that we've got to think outside of the box. Uh, how can we do this in fresh, innovative ways to reach a whole generation that doesn't know Jesus? So please let us know your ideas. But at the same time, I want to encourage you as we go through this series to be thinking about yourself individually as to how can I, as a follower of Jesus, begin to live out the things that we're talking about in this particular sermon series on making disciples because it's each of our responsibility. And please know this, this is a process that you need to be involved in. Not because Jesus says, I've entrusted this to you, that's first and foremost, but also for this reason, making disciples is one of the surest ways for you to grow as a disciple. If you want to move further in your journey to be more like Jesus, then get involved in sharing Jesus with somebody else. And that'll move you on that journey. So where does the discipleship process begin? Well, turn your Bibles to John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, we get to eavesdrop on a conversation that takes place between Jesus and a Samaritan woman who is currently living with a man after five failed attempts at marriage. And it is a fascinating conversation. In fact, it's one of my favorite conversations in all of Scripture. At some future point, we'll come back, we'll revisit this conversation, because I just, I love the conversation. But for today, I want to fast forward to the end. 
And as you get to the end of the story, here's what you begin to realize. That there are people who live in the same village of this particular woman who now have come to believe or to be disciples of Jesus Christ. You say, how in the world did that happen? Well, here's how it happened. It, it, this move from unbelief to belief started with a simple invitation. It was an invitation into a conversation that started this woman down the path to believe. Now, mind you, it was an invitation into a conversation that she never in her wildest dreams anticipated. A Jewish man striking up a conversation with her in the middle of the day at a well. you got to be kidding me. Nobody sees that coming, but Jesus did it. And then it's an invitation from this woman to her fellow townspeople that gets them moving down the path that's going to lead them to a place of faith. Here's the invitation, John chapter 4 and verse 28. Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Invitation, come see this guy that I've just been hanging out with who's been talking to me about my life and about how my life can be different. Come see him. It's the invitation. And this is the place that discipleship almost always begins. An invitation into an environment, an invitation into a conversation, an invitation into a relationship that gives the person an opportunity to experience Jesus Christ. And so step one for us at Campbell is simply this, create an invitation culture. Create an invitation culture. Can you say that with me? Create an invitation culture. That's exactly right. In just a few moments, we're going to highlight some of the ways that we're trying to do that as a church. But please keep this in mind. Nothing is as effective as a personal invitation from you. Now, where might you invite people to experience Jesus? We can invite them to Sunday morning worship, to your home group, to a ministry that you're involved in. You might invite them to a special church event like Easter egg hunt or breakfast with Santa. You can invite them to a support group like the, uh, oh, I just went blank on the group that Taryn's leading. I'm sorry, but it's a support group on Tuesday morning. And then mops you can invite people to. You can invite them to Bible studies and fun events that you're doing with fellow Christ followers. I want to encourage you to constantly be asking this question, whom can I bring with me? Who can, who can I bring with me? Now, here's the thing. There are a lot of people who would say yes to a simple invite. In fact, according to research, several different studies, 60 to 70 percent of unchurched people would accept an invitation from a friend, family member, or neighbor to attend a worship service. Let that sink in for just a moment. 60 to 70 percent would say yes. Yes, a whole lot of people out there who are just waiting for somebody to invite them. Here's the unfortunate news. The unfortunate news is there are not a whole lot of invites being made. You see, studies also indicate that only 19% of church goers have invited anyone to attend a church service with them in the past six months. Now, keep this in mind, that stat is pre-COVID. So if in your mind you're thinking, well, obviously it's that low because we've all been watching online or people are hesitant to cut. No, that's, that's pre-COVID. So I imagine the stats now are probably around 10%. I don't know. I'm just guessing. But the point is there aren't a whole lot of invites being made. Why so few? Well, I think one of the reasons is because many of us are, we're a little bit nervous. We're fearful of how the person might respond. In our minds, we tend to believe that if we offer an invitation to come to a church service, they're going to respond a lot like this. Watch this video. Just ask him. What's the worst that could happen? Hey, Jeff. I was wondering if you'd like to go to church with us sometime. Code red, code red, get the kid from the car, just like we practiced, honey. Yeah, work, listen, not coming in Monday. Maybe just asked me to go to church. We're skipping town. (laughs) 
Hey, Jeff. Oh, hey, man, what's going on? Hey, uh, I was wondering if you'd like to join us for church on Sunday. Yeah, I don't see why not. Cool, man. All right, might a person say no to your invitation? Of course. But is that really what's keeping you from offering that invitation? Does the possibility of a no keep you from inviting a friend to dinner, movies, a ball game? It doesn't. So what's the real issue? The real issue is this. I'm nervous that if I invite that person, not only will they say no, but they'll begin to withdraw the relationship or they'll write me off as being weird and crazy. Now, might they? They might, but probably only if you act weird and crazy to them saying no. And one of the best ways to keep from acting weird and crazy is to refuse to take no personally. That's easier said than done, but there's no reason to take it personally. Just because a person is not interested in going to a church service or relationship with Jesus does not mean that they are rejecting you. So how do you deal with it if a person says no? Well, how about this? No problem. Maybe next time. Or how about something like this? Totally understand If you're ever interested, let me know. It's as simple as that. We don't have to make it awkward. We don't have to assume that they're going to write us off. Now, if being a Christian hasn't caused a person to turn away from you yet, an invite to church probably isn't going to. Now, if you're thinking, but you know what? What if they don't know I'm a Christian and now they're going to find out? If that's your fear, we probably need to have a different conversation. (laughs) Some of us don't invite simply because we don't know how. And so to help us with this, I want to share a conversation with you that I shared with one of Campbell's great inviters this past week, Mr. Noah Radoni. Hey, Noah, thanks so much for taking time to share a conversation with me. Hey, I heard you recently invited somebody to church. Can you tell me who that is? Uh, that was Nick. Nick. And, and how do you and Nick know each other? Do you guys work together? No. <laughs> no uh, are you on the same bowling team? No. No? How, well, how do you know him then? Um, I met him at school. At school. That is great. And can you tell me, how did, how did you invite Nick to church? By asking him. Really? What would that sound like? Um, Nick, do you want to come to church? <laughs> That's all you say? You said, Nick, you want to come to church? That is great. And what did Nick say? Yes. He said yes. That's awesome. Hey, Nick's here with us today. Nick, come on over and join our conversation. Please. Nick, we are so glad that you came to church when Noah invited you. How many times have you been here at Campbell to Bible class? Have you been once or twice? How many times? Plus this week, it's four times. Four times! That is fantastic! And how do you like it so far? I can play the games in Bible class. You like playing games in Bible class? Very good. Well, we are really glad that you're here. And Nick and Noah, I just want to thank you so much for being friends. And Noah, for being the type of friend who would invite your friend to come to church with you. So Nick has not only, or Noah has not only invited Nick, but he's invited three or four of his other classmates, and he's constantly thinking about who he can invite next. And from what I hear, one of his big goals is to be able to invite his teacher eventually. Can can we just praise God for what he's doing through his servant, Noah? And we want to say thank you to Nick and to his mom, Kay, for being with us and taking a chance on coming to this place. We are so very glad that you're here. And so I want us to just take a moment to practice what Noah taught us this morning. So everybody stand up for a moment if you would. All right. 
turn to the person next to you, invite them to church. <laughs> Would you like to? <laughs> Jeff, right over here. <laughs> All right, turn to the person on the other side of you, invite them to church. Okay, for the sake of time, we're going to have to shut it off right there, but thank you. <laughs> Folks, it, it is that easy. It's that easy as Noah's taught us. It's just caring enough about people to turn and say, hey, would, would you like to go to church with me on Sunday? Or would you like to go to my home group? Would you like to hang out with a group of friends as we go bowling or whatever it is? It's just inviting Inviting people into spaces and relationships and conversations where they might have the opportunity to experience Jesus. Now, for some of us, the reason that we hesitate to invite somebody maybe to a church service is because we're, we're nervous about what they'll experience when they get there. I remember having a conversation with a good friend of mine in a previous congregation, very involved, always there, passionate about Jesus, but one day I just said, hey, why is it that uh, why isn't it you don't invite uh, your friends to church, your neighbors, your coworkers? He's very well known in the community, great leader, had tons of contacts. He said, Sean, here's the deal. He said, before you got here, he said a few years prior to that, I'd invited my friends to church, and so they would come to church. And uh, I love our church, but they would come to church. They'd have the experience. They'd walk out, and they would say this, that's a sweet little church. It reminds me of what church must have been like, kind of a little house on the prairie. Now, that, that's fine if you live in certain places in the country, in certain environments, it matches that culture. But when you're in a major metropolitan city, people tend to be looking for a different experience. And so he said, it's just, I, I know they're going to end up going somewhere else. So I want to say this to you this morning. If there's something we're doing that's causing you to pause or hesitate to invite your friends to this place, then please let us know. We want to hear that. We want to do everything we possibly can to remove some of those barriers. Now, please keep in mind, we may not be able to change everything. I meet everybody's preferences, and, but, but we want to do the best that we possibly can. At the same time, I want to ask this of you. I want to ask you to please keep in mind, or uh, how am I going to phrase this? Try not to assume what you think is a little bit cringy or weird that necessarily your friends are going to feel the same way. There is a chance that a friend of yours will come here and they'll hear an a cappella song for the first time and they'll say, you know what, that really moved me. To hear all four parts like that, that was so different and it moved me. And there's a good chance that a friend of yours might say, I didn't notice the volume of the guitar at all. Like, I, I'm used to that, so that's what I listened to on the radio all the time. I, I enjoyed that. That was a great experience. There's a chance, I know this is slight, but there is a chance that some of my poorly timed and delivered jokes that make your eyes roll, your friend might think's funny. I know, I know, it's weirder things have happened. And there's a chance that some of the people that you think you are a little bit weird, they're going to think, that person's an absolute sweetheart. And so most importantly, don't overlook what God may be doing in the life of a person. You see, when God's really seeking the heart of a person, which he does every single person, and that person is genuinely seeking God, when those two things are taking place, they're going to find each other even in the most unlikeliest of spaces. And so from our teens all the way to our adults, I know there are moments when you think, I'm not going to ask this person because I don't know the, the sermon they're going to hear or the music or the encounter they'll have with so-and-so. I'm just not sure. I feel a little bit nervous about it. I get that. We're working on it. We're going to do the best we possibly can. But don't, please don't. Decide something for your friends and decide what God's doing in their life. Give them, give God, give everyone the opportunity to experience each other, find each other, and to be in an environment where they can have that encounter with Jesus Christ. 
Now, as we think about inviting people, whether it's to church service, a home group, a Bible study, out to coffee, I want to encourage you to please listen. Listen to the Holy Spirit. As you read about the very first disciples making disciples just all over the world, what you quickly begin to discover is they're, they're being led, they're being directed, and they're being directed by the Holy Spirit. So I want to encourage you to listen to the Holy Spirit at all times. You begin to read through the book of Acts, and you realize that, hey, Philip, he didn't just decide on a whim, I'm going to go hang out on a desert road near Gaza. No, He was moved. He was directed to go to that place because God was already working on the heart of an Ethiopian eunuch, and he needed the two to find each other. And so he said, you go here. And then with Peter, he didn't decide, you know what, today's a good day to knock on the door of a Gentile and see if we can have lunch together. In fact, he didn't want to go, but he was directed because God was working in the heart of Cornelius, and he said, i got to get these two guys together. And so, Peter, here's where you need to go. Here's where you need to be. And Paul, he didn't decide, you know what, I think Macedonia sounds like the next great place to go. No, it was a vision that said, Paul, I need you in Macedonia because there are people there who are waiting to hear the good news of Jesus. And so he went. And the same spirit who directed then is directing us today. The question is, will we tune in? So I encourage us every single day to be praying for the Holy Spirit to put us in the environment, proximity of people who need to hear the message of Jesus Christ or to encounter Christ. Listen to the Holy Spirit, but also listen to people. Listen to people. What are we listening for? Well, Andy Stanley shares three cues to be listening for in conversations. Cue number one is simply this, things are not going well. So you're in a conversation and the person says, marriage is really struggling. Kids are finding it really difficult to make friends at school. I just found out I've been diagnosed with this particular illness. Things aren't going well. Cue number two, I was not prepared for this. I wasn't prepared to have kids who are struggling with addiction. I... This is the wrong time. I wasn't prepared to lose my job. I wasn't prepared to find out my parents been diagnosed with Alzheimer's at this age. I'm just not prepared. Cue number three, I'm not from here. Just moved from another state, just moved from another country, just moved from another part of the Bay Area. But I don't know people here. I'm brand new. And Stanley says these are moments when people are especially open to an invitation. So listen to the Holy Spirit and listen to people. As I mentioned, we want to share with you some of the ways that we're trying to put these things into practice here at Campbell, how we want to be an inviting group of people. So we're going to do this each week where we share with you some of the practical things that we're trying to do. And each week we're going to have a different minister share that information with you. Brian's going to get us started this morning. Yeah, so we're just going to scratch. We're just going to have painful experience there. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about the way that we're creating an invitation culture. Did it come back in? Okay, creating an invitation culture. And one of the biggest ways that we do that, as Sean was talking about, the woman at the well, she said, come and see. It wasn't come and see what I've been doing. It was come and see Jesus. And so that's what we want to create here is our church, not to say come and see all the things that our church is doing, come and see what God is doing in our church community and come be a part of that. And so um, Campbell Christian Schools, who we share a campus with, is one of our our biggest opportunities to invite. And so one of the things that we do is um, in the car line, if you're a CCS parent, you may have seen us a couple times. Maybe we're dressed up. You know, we had, we did it for trunk and treat with Halloween costumes. We did it around Christmas time. So before some of the bigger events that we're hosting, before the breakfast with Santa, the trunk and treat, before our Easter egg hunt, we get out in the car line. It gives us a chance to help the kids get into their car, to meet parents, and to invite them and say, hey, we've got an Easter service coming up. Hey, we're having a a trunk and treat. Hey, we have this thing called breakfast with Santa. Please come and check it out. And in addition to that invitation, it also just shares some of the things that God is doing through our church family. Go to our next slide. We also have an opportunity at CCS to um, 
have the junior high and elementary school chapel. So these are either weekly or biweekly. We get a chance to be in front of the students here at Campbell Christian. We have games, we have worship, we have a devotional, and it's a really cool touch point for Marion and myself and Lauren to connect with the students. And I know for Lauren and I, each time we are inviting them, hey, we have middle school meetup. Please come and check it out. It's kind of like this. If you enjoyed today, please come and check out some of the ministry events that we have going on. One of my favorite pictures, if you go back to that slide, is the bottom right. This was one of our middle school meetup events. You see a lot of CCS gear. We had 12 students there. Nine of them were from Campbell Christian, and only three of those are faces that you probably recognize. So about half of our students were CCS students that had responded to that invitation. We've also been able to coach um, a couple different sports, and that's been a cool connection point with the school as well. We go to the last slide here. So this is our kind of our big events, right? Our trunk and treat, um, Coco with Santa this year. These are really awesome opportunities. If you're at Trunk and Treat, our estimate is 1,200 people. If you were there, you know that might be kind of low. There were a lot of people that responded to the invitations that we had put out. So that was really encouraging. At Coco with Santa, we had about 100 families. And in our questionnaire, when you sign up, it shows, you know, how did you hear about this event? And so our stats show about 75, 80% of the people that came weren't from our church. They heard about it from social media, from a CCS connection, from a friend. So these are really awesome opportunities, and we are not just having these things and sending them on their way. We're inviting them, hey, there's more here. There's more that we can do. Other ways that we're reaching out is, you know, through social media. Ruth does a lot of really cool things on social media. We had a living room worship night here last summer, we had about two or 300 people here, and I would say maybe a quarter of those people were from our church. And I, as I met people at the event, there were people, oh, I saw a sign in a coffee shop. Oh, I just got an ad on my Instagram feed, and I showed up. And it wasn't just a cool worship night. I mean, it was that. But we had six people that gave their lives to Christ in that baptistry, that we got to celebrate that together. And hopefully, we pray that those are disciples that are then making disciples. And so as Sean has mentioned today, really what I'm talking about here is kind of church initiatives. And those are important. We're going to keep doing those things. But what's way more important is what each of you are doing in your communities. If we think about all the different touch points that you have, the web of people that you're connected to in your work, in your school, in your friendships, there are so many people out there that we can invite to come and see what God is doing here. So I would encourage you as we kind of wrap up today to consider ways that you can do that. Thank you. All right, so what's the next step for us? Here's what I want to encourage you to do. I want to encourage you this afternoon sometime to start making a list of people that you know that maybe aren't connected to Jesus in any way. Or maybe those that you know who at one time were active followers of Jesus, but they kind of just, they're not right now for whatever reason. Make that list, make it individually, make it as a family, post it somewhere that you're going to see on a regular basis, and begin to pray over those people every single day. As you pray, if not before, at least by our Easter service, invite them to come be with us. That's kind of the challenge, the goal, the next step. Now, please keep in mind, this isn't simply about getting people to a church service or an activity or an event. It's really just the first step in hopefully giving a person the opportunity to encounter the love and grace of Jesus Christ that begins them on a lifelong journey of being fully formed in the image of Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate goal, that they join us as we journey together to more perfectly reflect our Savior, Jesus Christ. We did want to put something in your hands that might make it a little bit easier, and we're going to work on some other cards as well, but this is just a simple invitation card. You'll find them on the, uh, the back little table back here if you want to pick some up. You can take those with you, just have them in your car or wherever you might be, and hand those out to people very simply. It doesn't have to be a long conversation, just maybe you're at a restaurant, and you've struck up a conversation with the person waiting at your table and say, hey, I really enjoyed our conversation today. Uh, just I, I go to the Campbell Church. If you're ever interested in stopping by, here's an invitation. Simple as that. But be thinking and looking for ways, praying for the Holy Spirit to lead you 
You'll be in a proximity to the people that God's seeking, working on their hearts. Step into those moments. It may change their life. It may change your life, hopefully to change all of our lives. Thanks so much for being with us today. It's uh, been good to spend time with you. You may be thinking like, well, what about, what about, what about, we're just on step one. Okay, please keep that in mind. We got five weeks and then we'll worry about the whatabouts after we get to that point. Uh, but I'm excited. I'm excited about what God's doing among us. I'm excited about the people who have taken a chance to invite some people, new faces that are with us. And we love you being here with us, and we hope to get to know you better if we haven't had the chance to uh, spend some time with you at this point. But just know that you are such a welcome presence here, and uh, you make us better. Thank you for being here.